Good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. Um, welcome to the third webinar of this training program on making the voice of social partners count in UN processes. Thank you for joining us on time. I hope there will still be a few people us joining us for this webinar. Um, but thank you for being uh, punctual and already being with us. Um, Last Friday, we spoke about the uh, uh, 2030 agenda. We spoke about South-South cooperation, fragility. Huh? We had a very nice presentation uh, by the G7 plus. Um, and today we are continuing with the topic of uh, UN reform. UN reform, but also um, how does impact uh, tripartism? the involvement of workers' employers' organization uh, in the ILO agenda, in the UN agenda. Um, UN reform has been going on for many years, and I think there's a lot of, uh, we don't want to know all the details, but there is a lot, I think, that is very relevant for uh, workers' and employers' organizations to, to hear about. And we're going to talk um, about the South-South cooperation angle of that also. So it is my pleasure to present uh, speakers for today. And that is in first instance, Tanya Caron. Tanya Caron is a senior multilateral relation officer at the uh, International Labour Organization based at the headquarters in Geneva. Hi, Tanya, hi. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi, hi everyone. <laughs> Thanks for inviting me. <laughs> yes, great to have you. Um, the, um, Tanya is working on in the area in the ILO that is really dealing with uh, the relationships between uh, the International Labour Organization and the UN, um, making sure that the decent work um, agenda is part of the UN agenda, but also uh, supporting uh, constituents and uh, country offices on things that have to do with uh, the United Nations um, agenda and United Nations processes. So I think you're very well uh, uh, positioned there to, to help us with this uh, rather complicated topic of UN reform and thank you for joining us. Uh, then I'm happy to present Fernando Santa Mauro, officer at United Cities and Local Government. And as you have noticed in all of these webinars, we have somebody who really can look at things from that South-South angle. Uh, how can we really make sure um, that that is part of our efforts? And Fernando Santo Mauro um, is based in Barcelona, working for U um, United Cities and Local Governments, which is an umbrella organization I think the biggest in the world, uh, uniting local governments, municipalities, cities, and um, making sure that the voice of uh, these local governments, cities, uh, regional governments are heard uh, also in the 2030 agenda and UN processes. So thank you so much, Fernando Santomaro, for being with us today. And um, after your presentations, we will look at a few examples of how workers and employers organizations in different parts of the world have sort of found their angle and their um, way of engaging with the 2030 agenda. Um, and we will finalize the webinar with a little discussion on, on, on how you see that uh, as participants in this, uh, in this training program. So welcome again. And without further ado, I will then give the floor to Tanya Caron, Senior Multilateral Relations Officer at ILO Headquarters. Thank you, Tanya. 
Thank you, Linda. I'll share my screen first. What is the, this one? So do you see my uh, presentation? Yes, yes, not yet okay. on full screen, that is it, thank you. Okay, I will just put it like this because I'm not to be disturbed. Um, so I will talk a little bit about the Dorian reform, not in details because uh, uh, not all details are important. Well, they are important, but I think for the, 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 the training, the, 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 it's not uh, relevant to talk about all the details, but I will try to focus on the, the part of the UN reform that are relevant to uh, workers and employers uh, organizations. So uh, first I want to talk about the, the context of the, of the UN reform. Um, so following the adoption of the 2030 agenda and the SDGs in 2015, it became clear that the UN was not fit for purpose for assisting member states uh, to reach the goals of the agenda. So after discussions and negotiations, uh, the UN General Assembly uh, in a resolution of 2016 reaffirmed the need to strengthen the UN development system to enhance its coherence and efficiency as well as its capacity to two things among others. So first, uh, address all development challenges of our time in order to realize the 2030 agenda. And secondly, uh, to continue to adapt and respond to new challenge and challenges and opportunities such as extreme poverty, climate change, displacement, inequality, erosion of human rights, and to ensure that no one is left behind. Um, so um, the, I, I'm a, the, the, the reform, the UN reform, uh, the United Nations reform, uh, comprises three interlinked track within uh, an overarching vision of conflict prevention and greater currency efficiency and integration in field operation. So these um, include um, a restructuring uh, of the a restructuration of the UN peace and security architecture, um, the UN management uh, reform, and the repositioning of the UNDS, uh, of, the, of the UNDS. Uh, I won't talk about peace and security and management. I will focus my presentation on the UNDS reform because uh, this area mostly um, concern the ILO. So this uh, area uh, seeks to improve the system's currency and address long-standing uh, concern about um, fragmentation and duplication of efforts among the system's funds, programs, and specialized agencies, particularly at country level. Uh, with regard to the UNDS, um, the General Assembly adopted in 2018 a resolution called it's a long title, sorry, repositioning of the UNDSS in the context of the quadrennial comprehensive policy review of operational activities for development of the UN, UN system. This resolution contains uh, UN states uh, decisions on concrete measures to enhance the capacity of the UNDS to better support countries in their effort to implement the 2030 agenda and provides also guidelines uh, to Secretary General and the UNDS in their uh, implementation. In the UNDS reform, there is seven building blocks um, I won't talk about the seven building blocks, but I will focus my presentation, oops, sorry, on four of them. Um, maximizing UNDS impact, a new generation of country teams, uh, the new resident coordinator system, and also um, the system uh, wide approach to partnership. Um, basically, um, just to resume a little bit uh, these four um, building blocks, uh, the reform put in place 
um, a, a new resident coordinator system that enhanced their capacity, uh, leadership, accountability, and impartiality. So the, the RCs became the maximal representation of the UN system in the country, and they have an important role in the process of developing and adopting the new uh, cooperation framework, and also the common country analysis, among others. Regarding the new cooperation framework, it became the main uh, strategic planning tool for achieving the SDGs at national level. And um, it, they have, it have to be developed by UN country teams in close consultation with governments and relevant stakeholders. So including employers and workers organizations. I will talk about the, your, the specific role of um, social partner here, but I will talk a little bit later, but just to mention that when they talk about relevant stakeholders, they include also workers and employers organization. Regarding the common country analysis, uh, it underpins the cooperation framework and became a real time core analytical function with um, uh, require periodical updating. Um, okay, so this is the frame. Uh, so of course, uh, the reform, uh, the UNDS reform uh, has had an impact on the other work. Uh, so it has changed the way that all UN agencies work uh, and has a significant implication for ILO's operational and programming activities at global, regional, and country levels. So in three years of implementation of the, 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 the UNDS reform, we can say that the main objective of the reform have been met, but still uh, there is still a work to, uh, to be done. So among the, 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 the work done, the new resident coordinator system is now operational uh, and governance documents related to the new RC system uh, and also regarding uh, cooperation framework and CCAs has been adopted. Uh, we have to mention that from the outset, Diallo has been a very active partner in the reform at all level, from the director general and deputy directors general, uh, the senior management specialists and other staff at Edgewater and in the field, um, and also uh, ILO uh, country office director and national coordinators who represent Diallo in the UN country team. While some difficulties uh, remain in adapting the new way of working, the office continues to focus on maximizing the benefit that reform can bring to the ILO and its constituents in fulfilling its mandates and achieving the organization's uh, objectives. Overall, the implementation of the reform of the, of the reform as uh, progress we can say satisfactory despite the crisis generated by COVID-19. Uh, of course the crisis has changed the UN and its reform with the need for a large scale response. Uh, the COVID-19 has acted, I must say as a catalyst and it has stimulated closer collaboration within the UN development system. Uh, I must also mention that Yellow has played an important role in the creation of the UN framework established for an immediate uh, socio-economic response uh, to COVID-19. And um, the ILO has actively contributed to UN country assessment and responses and response plans. Um, I want to talk a little bit about alliances. Uh, in September 2020, the ILO and UNDP agreed on the creation uh, of a global framework for action, which set out uh, seven priorities area in which the ILO and UNDP will collaborate to consolidate uh, sustainable development gains in the world of work uh, in the context of the pandemic, but also in the post-pandemic period. Uh, and also the office has um, signed a move 
uh, with UNICEF to improve the employability of young people and help the transition from school to work. And the office is finalizing uh, another agreement with uh, FAO. Now, let's talk a little bit about the development of the USDS, the UNDS reform. Uh, what has happened uh, for the last three years? Um, and, uh, and let's see a little bit how, we, first we will talk a little bit about the, the view of the, of, the, the, of the UN and maybe a little bit about how we see that from the ILO's perspective. So uh, I mentioned that significant progress has been made on the reform, on the implementation of the reform. Um, in some area, uh, areas, reform has uh, already beginning the beer of fruit, but from the ILO, we still have perspective. Uh, in December 2020, the General Assembly adopted a new um, QCPR resolution. Uh, for those who are not familiar with the acronym QCPR, it means Quadriennal Comprehensive Policy Review of Operational Activities for Development of the United Nations System. Uh, it is basically the mechanism through which the General Assembly assess the effectiveness, efficiency, coherence, and impact of the operational activities of the United Nations for the development. And the UNDS reform is part of it. So uh, in this last QCPR resolution, uh, the General Assembly, um, amongst others, uh, welcomed the progress achieved in the reform of the resident coordinator system. Uh, the resolution also recognized that each uh, individual entity's mandate, expertise, and cooperative advantage brings the more coordinated and integrated UN development system. The resolution also reiterates the imperative to leave no one behind and the importance of promoting gender equality and the empowerment of women and girls and recognize the UN contribution to the promotion of human rights. Uh, it also mentioned uh, the importance of supporting countries in implementing social protection systems and also to mentioning the principle of disability inclusion in the policy and programs of the UNDS. And finally, I want to mention that too, because um, uh, for, the, for the training, the, re the resolution also outlines that the UN development system should promote partnership and enhance South-South and triangular cooperation. Uh, regarding the challenge, I will mention briefly two of them. Uh, there is still a challenge um, with the financing of the resident coordinator system, and also um, in the harmonization of the programming instruments such as cooperation framework, um, uh, and our descent for country program. And in a couple of minutes, I will talk a little bit more about uh, this challenge um, uh, regarding the harmonization between the descent for country program and the cooperation framework. Uh, so first I want to uh, talk about uh, the opportunity for the social dialogue, the social dialogue of the UN reform. Um, and I think it is very important. Uh, as you may know, the ILO governing body has been examin examining the, um, the implication, challenges, and opportunities of the reform for the ILO and the constituents, and has provided guidance to the director general on its implementation within the framework of the activities of the office. The last time the GB examined the issue was in March 2021, when the GB, among others, uh, took note of the statute of the UNDS reform and the implementation of the Office Plan of Action uh, on the issue. And the GB also invited the Director General to take into consideration the view expressed by the governing body 
in the continued engagement in implementing the reform and uh, supporting tripartite constituents to engage in the UN cooperation framework and, country, and common country analysis. So from the ALO perspective, there, is, uh, there are three case elements to preserve in the process reform, the tripartite governance structure and the role of its social partners, the normative mandate of the ILO and the great relevance of the international labor uh, standards and the program priorities of the ILO. Uh, so for the constituents, the UNDS reform is an opportunity to demonstrate the added value of a tripartite model of policymaking to a wider audience and expanding the influence of the ILO and its constituents in promoting decent work and international labor standards. Also, the reform could uh, open new avenues for employers and workers' organizations to engage in national sustainable development planning and contribute to the reform with the views from the real economy. So now regarding the role of social partners um, in the UN reform, but also in the process uh, of the UN reform, there are several level uh, that uh, several level entry point uh, where uh, social partners can um, can participate um, and can preserve tripartite uh, governance and focus on uh, the pillars of decent work the global, regional, national, and uh, local levels. Um, regarding the global um, level, um, I want to mention that ITUC and IOE um, both conduct their preparation uh, and their own and old side events um, at the high level political forum on sustainable development, the HLPF, uh, which give them a voice. So also at the global level, ITUC and IOE are part of the major group structure of ECOSOC and UNGA. Uh, this group, this major group, uh, negotiate who represent them for statement and in processes in, uh, for example, uh, expert group meetings. Uh, and with the help of the ILO and the UND, UNDESA, um, I took and uh, IOE were nominated as major group representatives for workers and business uh, respectively. At regional level, um, it is possible for social partner to, uh, through ECLAC, the United Nations Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean. So it is possible through that to participate uh, and, and participate particularly in the VNR, the Voluntary National Report, because when uh, it is the review of the Voluntary National Reports, ECLAC organized national meetings with all stakeholders in order to consult them about the situation in the country and, the, and, the, and the, the report. So it is possible through that also to social partners to, um, to give their voice. Uh, at national level, which is mainly uh, what it is uh, all are important, but I want to, in the context of the UN reform, I think it is uh, very relevant. At national le level, uh, and as mentioned before, the cooperation framework is the main strategic tool at the national level uh, for the achievement of the SDGs. However, for us, for the ILO, uh, the main framework to support constituents at the national level is the Decent Work Country Program. So, and even with the reform, the Decent Work Country Program is still the main framework for, uh, for the ILO constituents. So in the new context, uh, with the new uh, cooperation framework, uh, a Decent Work Country Program should be developed as the main support framework at the national level for the participation of ILO tripartite constituents in the new cooperation framework. Uh, 
It means that it is important to have a strong decent work uh, country program in order to allow the ILO and the constituents to fight uh, and lobby for the inclusion of constituents' priorities during the development of the CCF, the, the Common Country Analysis, and also uh, the cooperation framework, and as well as to include um, uh, ILS, for example, in the, in the process. So it is very important that workers and employers organization are involved in all phases of the process of their country cooperation framework development and also in the process of the developing of the CCA. Um, because it is an opportunity to ident identifying uh, the structural problem that are, uh, that are placed as obstacle to achieve uh, the SDGs in the country and to define also priorities uh, areas. Um, in that context, it is really important that uh, the social partners, employers and workers organizations develop communication channel with RCs in order to take to be taken into account in the development uh, process of CCA and NCF. Um, I emphasize that because uh, in some countries uh, we can see, and, and Linda will talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes, but we can see that it's not always the case that uh, workers and employers organizations are not always involved uh, in, the, in the process of uh, developing CCA and NCF. For example, uh, well, I will talk a little bit about that, but I can I will talk about the I'm involved in a, in a, with some uh, African uh, African offices in offices in, in Africa uh, regarding the drafting of the CCA, and, and I will talk a little bit uh, what is the situation in some countries uh, um, in Africa. So. And I want also uh, to finish that point on social partners. I want to talk a little bit about the normative uh, mandate uh, and um, to mention that, uh, well, in general, no, in the ILO, we have a lot of publications uh, and they are all very relevant uh, for the development of CCA and, and, and cooperation framework. And in particular, uh, the comments and recommendations made by the supervisory bodies are very important for identifying normative problem in countries. Uh, and as social partner, you have a great role to play in, in, in feeding the monitoring system uh, on the situation in your respective country when, when it is necessary. So don't forget that you have uh, uh, an important role and it is not, a, it's the, the ILO, it's the only organization with the, this possibility. Uh, and, and it is very important because also um, when we talk about um, uh, the application of a convention in a country, um, we have always new situation happening at the, at the national level. And then uh, the ILO through the, the, the supervisory body receive information from social partners. So it must, um, it could happen that uh, the, the cooperation framework, the final outcome, do not include the work of the ILO in standard setting or in standard setting activities. Uh, but I want to emphasize that it, 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 is, um, it could be added in the descent world country program as a separate outcome. So it means that if it doesn't appear in the cooperation framework, uh, and there is a new situation uh, to be addressed in the, in the national level regarding um, standard setting activities. So it could be added in the central country program as a separate outcome. So I think it is very important to, to mention that. Um, okay. And then uh, I will finish a little bit uh, talking about emerging good practices and challenges. Linda, as I mentioned, we'll talk about that, but uh, there's emerging, there's good practices and challenges um, on the work with the resident coordinators and the participation in common control analysis and cooperation framework processes. Um, I know that in Latin America, 
uh, Guatemala and Argentina, for example, have um, good example of uh, participating um, in, the, in the, the development of uh, cooperation framework and CCA, uh, and also good relation with the uh, resident coordinators. Uh, so, but there is still work to be done. Uh, and uh, I used to work in Latin America as standard specialist, but now I'm in headquarters and, and for my, my, my department, uh, I now work a little bit um, with some uh, countries officers in Africa. And I worked uh, in three CCAs in the development of three CCAs, CCAs now in the last uh, couple uh, weeks. Uh, and uh, specifically from a normative aspect, because I was standard specialist before. And I can say that there is not a lot of information on the draft CCAs. Um, uh, so we are trying to improve um, the draft and in, in including more uh, information from the, the comments and recommendation made by the, uh, the, the, the committee of experts or the, the supervisory bodies in general, depending on the situation in the country. Uh, but as part, this is for the, the normative aspect, but at the same time, I can say that uh, there's some uh, gap uh, for uh, social dialogue, tripartism, and the role of social partners, uh, and also in labor administrations. In general, like I, like I can see in that part now the world, like I, I, know, I don't know if it is the, the situation in your countries, and it will be interesting to hear from you uh, what is the situation and what is this happening in your in your countries. But uh, from this, uh, at least from in Burkina Faso, um, was Burkina Faso, Togo, uh, and the other one was Nigeria, I think. Um, there's still work to be done not just regarding the application of the convention, but regarding social dialogue, tripartism, and social partners. So I will stop here. Uh, I won't take much time. And, and I know that uh, Linda will talk a little bit of our good practices. Uh, and I will be available at the end if you have uh, any questions or, or comments. So thanks. Thank you, Tanya, for this uh, very clear uh, presentation. Uh, excellent. Um, and I hope it responds to a lot of questions, because as you say, uh, of course, UN reform is a, an opportunity for our constituents, right? It is an opportunity to, um, to have influence beyond the ILO agenda and really on the UN agenda and the agenda 2030. At the same time, I know there were many, many worries over the years. How is this going to work for the ILO and its constituents, this whole UN reform, right? And I think little by little, we, we figured it out, um, but there's definitely um, a need for support also to our country offices and our constituents to, to make this work over the coming uh, years and the coming decades. Exactly. Um, so I, I open for questions. Um, questions, comments, uh, but also feel free to, to share your own experience. And uh, I very much welcome Anita. Anita, I didn't present you at the beginning of the webinar because we all know you already, but uh, glad to have you on board again uh, today. And uh, please take the floor. Yeah, no, sure. I was in the opening and then last webinar and they'll see me again on Friday. But I just wanted to thank uh, Tanya for her excellent presentation, which uh, further deepens our knowledge on the SDG UN reform processes and giving us some concrete examples on this new work agenda. And I think also she made very nice linkages on how that works uh, in terms of South-South cooperation as well. She, she made a couple of references. So I think now uh, colleagues uh, will have a, 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 the understanding of why these all these three processes together in a way SDG, UN reform, and South South, why they come together and why it makes sense having them in one webinar. <laughs> Sometimes I ask, you know, why not three different webinars, but actually we really have to work in an integrated way. Today I was in the discussion on, on uh, our enabling outcome A for those who are not in the ILO is the outcome that deals with knowledge, partnerships, communication. And um, as uh, both our departments, multilaterals and partnerships department are represented, 
uh, we were there, you know, listening and the, these questions on SDGs and the linkages with the South South and UN reform and how people can help each other were pretty much on the top of the agenda. So just to say, um, you know, we, we all concluded that next biennial will continue working on this. And now that we have this material uh, on in, in English and in Spanish, I think we can, you know, do for more regions or more work. Eventually, maybe we can do a French version. But just a small comment to add to his comment. And I know when we reach uh, Fernando, he's going to go more in depth on the South South South. Thank you, Linda. And thank you, Tanya. Thank you, Anita. And thanks. I'm sure Fernando will give more information about the South South Corporation. I just want to mention, and I didn't mention it in, the, in my presentation, that there will, um, tomorrow there will be a dialogue between um, ILO and, uh, and the RCs in the, in the Latin American and Caribbean region. So it will be basically, um, uh, the, the objective is mainly how we can improve our cooperation uh, in the Rand reform and, and particularly on the participation of the um, ILO constituents uh, in the developing CCA and, and, and cooperation framework. So it, it will happen tomorrow. So all very timely, thank you for that. <laughs> and uh, I uh, open, I encourage questions, comments from the floor. Any questions at this moment? Feel free. We're not a big group, so just open your microphone if you have any comments. We're really, also really pleased to have uh, Vera Guseva with us, the uh, worker specialist in the Caribbean office. So Vera, also at any point, uh, you will be uh, uh, intervening on the last webinar next week, Monday, but if you have any uh, comments from the, from the worker side, from the office ACTRA side, you're also very welcome. If not, if no comments at this point, no questions at this point, let us um, continue. And Fernando Santomaro, I already introduced you. You are an officer at the United Cities and Local Governments, UCLG, that is, largest network of uh, cities, governments, municipalities, regions, um, and doing a lot of work um, uh, also towards the 2030 agenda. And Tanya showed us sort of, you know, the global, regional, national, uh, local, and I think uh, at the local level and the local contributions to the uh, UN 2030 agenda, you are a very important uh, um, institution, but also partner to the ILO and other UN organizations. So really happy to have you on board and to give us also that South-South perspective, huh? uh, which I think you know, is your day-to-day -day, uh, way of working. Uh, it is also uh, how we would like to see it in this uh, training program. So looking forward uh, to your comments, presentation of your organization. And I think you have a video to share also with us. Yes, I would love to, to have a, uh, a lot of time here to, to share everything, but I will, <laughs> will try to stay in my 20 minutes. Linda, I'd like to, to thank you very much for the invitation and, and Anita, and to, just to comment that uh, what Tanya has explained now, it, it has a lot to do with the general process. We are uh, participating also from the, the municipalist movement, right? The international municipalist movement uh, that UCOG is part of. And uh, I am, as you said, like uh, from the UCOG for the last four years on the learning department, working uh, directly with the, the SDG localization, what we call, right? This process of adapting the global agenda to the local context and implementation and monitoring of the SDGs and global agenda um, process, right? But uh, just to say that I think it's similar of what we, what we are working with because as you mentioned, Tanya, uh, the necessity, the need of, um, 
uh, alliances with different stakeholders and uh, um, dialogue, right, with uh, workers and uh, employers and uh, enterprises. And we from the, the, the cities, uh, we and we that I, I've been working with uh, uh, local governments for the last 20 years in Brazilian cities, uh, just with that, right, trying to trying to enhance and try to um, enable this uh, dialogue with civil society, private sector, uh, local and regional governments, the, the multi-level uh, governance with national governments, international organizations, and international city networks as UCLG. So here I would like to, to talk a little bit more about um, about if you don't know what UCLG is and uh, what this uh, international uh, municipalist uh, movement that UCLG is part of. I will try to explain a little bit in three parts here. As Anita mentioned that the, it's all linked, right? The, the, the SDGs, the South-South cooperation and then UN reform. So we'll try to explain very fast here the, where we are here in, from UCLG and uh, focusing specifically more on the SDGs 11 and 17, and then explaining a little bit better what is this decentralized cooperation and the South-South cooperation of the cities. And we'll give some examples of that from, from my uh, own experience with UCLG and from Brazilian cities with South American and African cities too. And in third place, we'll try to uh, to, to explain a little bit where UCLG is uh, um, working uh, for uh, this, uh, what we defend this new uh, multilateral generation for a community driven uh, multilateralism, which I believe and we believe that cities have an important local and regional governance in general have a, a really important role uh, on that, right? Uh, enhancing the the, part, the general participation and um, changing the the international um, system uh, from a bottom up, right? This is what we we want to facilitate. So just to say here that UCLG is is from it's is the last uh, son of a, a, a very old movement uh, for just to make a. Uh, an example here, the, the, the first international union uh, of local authorities was created in 1913, so before even the League of Nations, right? But uh, before of the, uh, after that, we, we had uh, evolved uh, and after Istanbul and in 2004, all the international organizations of cities were unified uh, into uh, what is a, a UCLG today. So we, um, as Linda mentioned, we represent more uh, than 240,000 local governments and their national associations and regional sections uh, in more than 140 countries. And we also facilitate uh, currently the global task force of local and regional governments, uh, which is a, a task force that to, to do joint advocacy uh, on the global policy process. But um, since 2015, and obviously cities already, and I was part of that, were very active on the MDGs process, right? Uh, but after 2015, I think the the the, uh, the cities are more fundamental uh, because the 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 principles of, of the SDGs they defend a little uh, a different a different kind of uh, cooperation, right? Uh, and cities are, are fundamental on that and South-South cooperation, uh, especially, uh, I think, it, it, and its horizontality, uh, it has a lot to do with that. So just to mention here, the SDG 11, which is uh, the backbone of this localization process and, and is the result of this advocacy work carried by the, the urban community and is uh, a little bit the linkage of uh, every uh, urban impact of the 17 uh, goals. Uh, but uh, also, and mainly this is important for 
to understand why cities are important for South-South cooperation and, and the alliances and the strengthening of this uh, democracy. Uh, and I here I would like to, to share this, this, this video after this, just to, to mention that the SG 7T, the alliances, um, shows that we must uh, uh, enhance this policy coherence and uh, the global partnership, the availability, availability of reliable da data and, and different uh, partnerships, right? So I would like to share a little bit this, this video uh, that talks more specifically about what is the centralized cooperation, the linkage, the linkage with uh, SDG 17. Right, and just after that, I will pass to the 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 South South Corporation. Is your city an innovator, an enabler, a collaborator? Do you look beyond your boundaries? Decentralized cooperation is international development cooperation where local and regional governments share their unique potential to solve specific challenges. Their cooperation is critical to achieve the 2030 Agenda and post-pandemic recovery. That is why SDG 17 is about partnership. So what does this look like? In 1989, a Brazilian city initiated a process of participatory budgeting which inspired communities worldwide. Today, over 11,800 territories have taken up this practice, putting citizens' voices at the center. Yet it is not only sub-national governments investing significant resources. National governments, international organizations, private sector and academia are financially supporting this cooperation. Networking platforms and associations support thousands of leaders to connect on a variety of topics. They make local policies internationally visible. Decentralized cooperation is in the DNA of the international municipal movement. By combining strengths, local impacts are global impacts. No one and no place is left behind. Even through small projects, local communities feel our solidarity. For this, we need partnerships and an inclusive multilateral system. Join us, share your stories. Let's celebrate the local solidarity. Um... I think this shows a little bit uh, how the decentralized cooperation can uh, work with um, uh, the SDGs and some principles of the SDGs. And now I would like to say that the, the cities associations and, and local administrations, they have this power of uh, articulating the local stakeholders that are fundamental to establish this decentralized cooperation, the, the cooperation with uh, not only national uh, governments, uh, but also with international uh, organizations, civil society, academic institutions, and private sector. So I think the cities have this um, main important uh, articulating role and this process is uh, if we we if we consider a more recent uh, background we can we can see that this um, uh, decentralized cooperation movement and south south cooperation of cities are being uh, built for the last 20 years since, or the last 30 years maybe uh, since the forum of local authorities during the, the, the World Social Forums of Porto Alegre, the creation in, specifically in, in South America of a network of cities uh, that, that, that is Mercosudares that work with urban local policies for the regional integration and then with the creation of a more solid um, capacity of local and regional governments from South America, but also with the help of first European, but after that, uh, by, by themselves, uh, by the, the, the South American um, different organizations. And um, after 2000, 2010, mainly, the the beginning of the a more systematic work with local and regional governments of South America, with uh, the national uh, governments of the the continent, 
and also with Africa and also with triangular uh, cooperation with uh, uh, France, uh, with Italy, and um, also with the creation of some South American uh, institutional um, departments that could uh, uh, support this uh, decentralized cooperation and South-South cooperation of cities. So uh, we can see here this uh, evolution from the twinning on the 40s to solidarity on the 80s to more a technical exchange and the triangular cooperation from the 90s until now. And now with the different uh, uh, cities networks as UCLG, but also as Metropolis, Clay and and other networks, um, we are in a moment, a very interesting moment that we are um, in a way localizing the SDGs and the global agendas as uh, the resilience agenda, for instance, but uh, the, the SDGs and uh, at the same time doing a lot of peer learning and a lot of South-South uh, um, and, and triangular uh, cooperation. I believe, uh, as I mentioned before, the MDGs ha has this uh, official development assistance, and the SDG is now more horizontal, as that we we are uh, in a more broad uh, and and with the the sustainability discussion, we are in a more horizontal way of doing cooperation, not only financial but also and importantly uh, technical too. And we can see, oh, oh, sorry, I don't know. I don't know what we have here, sorry. Oh, well, the music is nice, you can continue. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what it is. I think, uh, I think it's the, the YouTube, I, I let it open now. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> I, I, I thought I was uh, ending my time. And I, <laughs> <laughs> no, but just just um, almost ending now. But with the the more specific examples of what is this um, South South cooperation of cities, right? And uh, I think uh, the local and regional government associations are interesting spaces and uh, appropriate environments to 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 gather different kind of South-South cooperation and partnerships and learning. And here I put it two different uh, projects and platforms that we have. One, one the, the, the one in the left is the, is the, all the platform of cooperation of Brazilian and uh, Mozambican cities that USOG has supported and, and facilitated. And the, the, the one in the right is the Marco Ciudades South-South uh, uh, platform cooperation which is very active and uh, it trains uh, local technicians to um, to think of uh, common projects for the uh, that in that case the regional integration but also with south south uh, with african cities and and caribbean cities too and uh, a practical example here from this uh, mercosudades uh, platform um, we had like an important project of, and with FAO of, of urban agriculture, uh, with the uh, ag agroecological experiences of urban farmers in Rosario and Belo Horizonte, and with the technical support of FAO, uh, supported the methodologies for uh, local training of urban uh, women, urban farmers in Guarulhos, that were uh, that started to produce. Uh, these products and uh, they were integrated in in local um, affairs and uh, also on the 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 food of uh, the schools of the local schools and another example here I think this is very interesting because it was it began as Guarulhos and Maputo uh, on a twinning uh, political twinning uh, inside UCLG. Uh, the, the UCLG Council, the both both cities were part of it, but after the the first um, programs of uh, South South cooperation of at that time the Brazilian government, the French government, and and for South South cooperation, 
and we started to do and we because we uh, it was part of this project so we started to do uh, cooperation on urban and solid waste uh, treatment with uh, Saint Saint Denis but also with Maputo and Matola and to to design to help to, to help design the the solid waste uh, program of those two cities there and from that after this uh, first project with uh, with France and and Mozambique and, and the national government of Brazil uh, both cities they started to cooperate by themselves and uh, financed by by themselves in other related topics as, as well we started with the solid waste treatment but we had like this important uh, problem of uh, human solid waste in Maputo and um, more specifically on the management of the municipal cemetery so that there was no space anymore right so uh, they started to do another kind of specific uh, cooperation in solid waste, but in management of uh, the municipal cemetery. And mm -hmm. from that, it, it, it went to, to another uh, uh, cooperation with, not only with Maputo, but in other cities of Mozambique, of uh, Nampula, uh, in urban planning and registering and participatory policies. So I'm just mm -hmm. mentioning that this is a way that when the decentralized cooperation starts um, and it's very difficult to stop after because the, uh, we generate a culture of participation and the uh, internationalization of the cities with concrete impacts. And when you have concrete impacts, it, it doesn't, right, uh, stops. Uh, but uh, just to mention that this project and another uh, that were happening at the same time, they generated this uh, usage platform of uh, cooperation in more general of uh, Brazilian and Mozambican cities in urban planning, registering and participatory policies. And then from there until today, we had like um, 29 sessions of uh, peer learning in different, right. uh, in, different, uh, in different areas, not only urban planning and participatory uh, policies, but uh, markets, local economic development, um, sustainability, resilience, and that um, after that, now after COVID, we start to do the same things and also the localization of global uh, agendas also online. So we are working that with um, webinars and online sessions, but, um, and now with ILO uh, starting to think of this uh, massive and open online course uh, specific on the, with the lead uh, local economic development forum about uh, innovation post-pandemic economic recovery and mm -hmm. just to say just to close uh just yeah clo fernando <laughs> yes no just closing that uh uh so with covid we we understood that this all this process uh and the importance of local public services is is urgent and and this from this from all the, the the sessions that we made during the COVID, uh, uh, two recommendations they brought up from the cities from bottom up. Uh, I would like just to mention here the the need for uh, an interurban system and the what we call this new uh, multilateral generation uh, that we need to uh, we need international measures that are wide, inclusive, effective, and that reach all territories. And this only can be achieved yeah. by uh, solid international and regional governance. And um, mm -hmm. we continue on that. We continue on that and we will continue uh, to, to mention and to participate. I believe this, uh, uh, this is also, we are part of the UN 75 uh, process. So uh, I would like to thank you, Linda. I'm sorry if I speak too much. But thank the, you the, so the... much, Fernando Santo Mauro. <laughs> thank you, guys. <laughs> thank you for, for your plea for more horizontal cooperation, for your examples of South-South cooperation at the local level, for sharing all of these, the learning tools huh, and the links that you show there. Um, they will for sure all be on our platform uh, where you can find those if you want to find more information. Uh, very rich presentation. Thank you. Uh, Fernando, are there any questions or comments on this part of the webinar?
No, colleagues? All super clear. Yeah. I always have comments, but let me wait for more people. <laughs> yeah. If no one comments, then I'll come. Go ahead, Anita. No, I just wanted to uh, thank the Fernando's presentation because it links uh, Tanya's presentation to the local level. So it kind of brings uh, the SDG when we form uh, peer learning agenda to the local level and why it's important to have it between cities, uh, between local governments, mayors. And we also have this form of cooperation I don't think you said it explicitly, but we call it a city to city cooperation. So this is part of what we, you know, and kind of a sub modality of South South that I said in the first day when I was <clears throat> presenting South South. So uh, I think the United Cities, you mentioned the triangle, you know, how cities cooperate and South South. So this for us is what we call city to city cooperation. And in the question of uh, South South, of course, it would be uh, within cities of the South. But if there's a Northern city, like you showed in your triangular, Cooperation, there will be a triangular cooperation. So it's, I think it's useful as well in terms of pedagogical, um, pedagogical for those who are here, you know, what are the forms of South South and how the reform agenda is also translated at the local levels. Um, so that's it for me now. I hope there will be some questions because it was very interesting presentations from both Tanya and Fernando. Over. No, I see no questions, but introduces interesting possibilities of cooperation. Thank you, Philip. Um, oh, I see some comments, but no questions. So that is also absolutely fine. Unless I see a hand, you can put up your hands at any moment, intervene at any moment. But uh, thank you again, Fernando. Now, uh, a key question that I'm going to ask you participants, and uh, we will come to that in a minute, is um, having seen this, how would you, as workers and employers organizations, like to see your engagement in uh, the 2030 agenda and UN processes? Uh, how do you see that engagement? Uh, to what extent are you engaging already through the ILO, directly, through whatever means? Um, and where would you would like to go from here? How do you see your role in UN processes? So that is the question that I have uh, for you as a group. And uh, we can either do that in groups or we can do that plenary. Maybe plenary is, uh, is better because we're not such a big group. But maybe to feed that question that I have to you on your engagement and how you see it, let me just share actually two examples from Latin America that I think are uh, particularly impressive of how workers and employers organizations are engaging in UN processes and contributing to the 2030 agenda. So I think you can see my, uh, my, my slides, and this is very short. Huh? This is just to give you some ideas as to what other workers and employees organizations are doing. So my workers example is from Argentina and my employers example is from uh, Guatemala. In Argentina, uh, la Confederación General del Trabajo, so the General Confederation of uh, Labor, uh, one of the key employers organizations in Argentina has created, led uh, this Argentine monitoring platform for the 2030 agenda. They call it Pampa 2030. Um, it was created by workers, but uh, it has actually 41 member organizations. It has uh, executed 26 projects, and it has also nine strategic partners. It has a website that you can easily find, Pampa 2030. Um, and this initiative led by the workers has uh, four very clear uh, um, objectives, which is to strengthen the cooperation between unions, social organizations and research centers to provide follow-up and monitoring of the 2030 agenda in Argentina. 
Um, secondly, to disseminate, to raise awareness, to sensitize and train all social and trade unions organizations regarding the, social, uh, the sustainable development goals to produce reports on the degree of pro progress in meeting the SDG target, and to influence the design of policies and regulatory frameworks in line with the SDGs. So here's a very clear message from the Argentinian trade union saying, we want to be there. We want to monitor what you're doing. We are raising awareness on the agenda. We produce reports, but we also want to influence the design of policies and regulatory frameworks. Um, and uh, they managed to build up this, this network of um, uh, trade unions, but also social organizations active in the field of education, health, human rights, um, uh, cooperatives, bringing them together and to say, hey, this is important. How can we influence and how can we also uh, implement? What role can we play? as trade unions and social organizations in the implementation of the 2030 agenda. Um, then they work also very uh, neatly with the International Labor Office in, in Buenos Aires and the UNDP, um, but also with the resident coordinators of this, of course. Uh, they've developed um, uh, uh, studies, um, documents on social protection, on education, on decent work, on um, cooperation, on, 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 uh, on poverty, all those as inputs um, to the 2030 agenda. Now, as you can imagine, this platform, uh, whenever in Argentina it is time to uh, revise the common country assessment, um, um, put together the, um, the co cooperation framework, implement certain aspects of it. Uh, this Pampa 2030 has become a very important partner. Um, when we spoke to them, they also clearly indicated that there was an opening uh, from the residence coordinators office, a lot of support from the ILO in doing this. Um, but yeah, they really feel that through these years of uh, hard work, they are there um, at the forefront, uh, being part of the implementation of the 2030 Agenda in Argentina. So that's a nice one. Now, the, my other example is from Guatemala. CACIP is the uh, committee that brings together the employers organization in the agricultural sector, the commercial sector, the industry sector. Um, so the umbrella organization of employers organization in Guatemala. Um, <clears throat> they have a sustainability committee and they um, started with very active engagement in the common country assessment and the common country framework. Huh? So in the assessment phase, but also in the planning phase of the uh, UN processes uh, in, in, in Guatemala. And then in 2019, they came up with a proposal that says, well, we as an employer's organization, we also want to actively contribute to the sustainable development goals. And they, um, they wrote a document about that and they proposed a, a, um, a series of 120 projects to be implemented through the seven business membership organizations that from part of CACIF, most agriculture, industries, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and they committed to produce annual reports of the progress. And that is what they did. And again, you can find this easily on the website, but it is in Spanish. Um, actuando en el presente, pensando en el futuro, acting in the present, thinking about the future. There's a website there that really uh, tells you about the business contribution, the employer's contribution, to the Sustainable Development Goals in Guatemala. And what they did, they very neatly um, made a distinction between um, Sustainable Development Goals, where they think they actually can control some of the targets, huh? um, where business can make a direct uh, impact, and other Sustainable Development Goals, where they say, well, we don't have control here, but we can influence, we can do... Um, 
uh, lobbying policy uh, influence, uh, and you see that here in front of you. And then um, now on an annual basis, they produce a report on that and saying um, those which of our projects, the ones that we have planned, the ones that came on later, uh, actually contributes to which SDGs, um, what is the money that was uh, invested by the private sector in these projects, and how many people actually benefited from it. So you find their projects that are about training, training workers and employers, you find their projects that are about uh, improving certain uh, processes in value chains, for instance, you find their projects that are more about improving regulations, simplifying regulations to the benefit of the sustainable development goals. And that is what they produce on an annual basis. So that was my short just to say, well, um, some workers and employers organizations um, um, you know, have um, are not just working closely with the ILO and the UN in general, they also create their own systems. Um, uh, I think, Tanya, these are some of the best examples that we have. And again, let me also say, um, you know, it takes two to tango, right? Uh, it needs uh, the workers and the employers organizations commitment, but it also needs the UN office saying, well, you are very welcome to, to join these discussions and to be part of this uh, common uh, efforts. And I'm sure, you know, Tanya, you know other experiences, but uh, these are two, uh, two, I think, outstanding ones. Um, that is an introduction. And um, uh, coming back to my question, how do you see your role uh, um, right now? What is already there? Um, where do you want to go as a works and employees organization? What obstacles do you see? And um, maybe also what support do you need in that process? And um, I would say, you know, given the time and given that we're a small group, let me open a whiteboard. Here it is. And um, just open the floor and um, open for your inputs and then I will take notes and uh, let's let's have a discussion on that. Who would like to go first? I think you can see my whiteboard, right? Yes, I see there are some points in the um, chat, Linda. There's new okay, Anita, can you is... can you take them? Because now that I'm taking notes, I'm yeah, I'll read them. The uh... Yeah. It says uh, new information and processes uh, to take in. I yeah. that the new information and processes will be something that will be integrated by the different uh, tripartite constituents. Yeah. And then another one that says no questions, but says interesting possibilities of cooperation. So I think there's already two points that we could highlight. And mm -hmm. I'm through peer learning, because that is a little bit how we had this question, no? Yes, okay, yeah. I've taken those. And I see your hands, come at Yassi. Oh, I have difficulties hearing you. Hear me? You have the floor. Okay. Uh, yeah, more or less. Let's try and see uh, what we can hear. Mm. However, Oh, the line is not good. Anita, can you hear or uh, maybe no. otherwise we work through the chat? No, unfortunately we no. cannot hear. Maybe he can write on chat. Yes, I think it will be better. We cannot hear it at all. Yeah. 
I'm sorry about that. Yeah, that's a pity, but uh, maybe it's possible to write in the chat. Good morning, Karatiasi. <laughs> so, yeah. In the meantime, anybody else who would like to take the floor? Any experience, any aspiration, need for support? Yes, please. I see uh, Vera's hand. Vera, thank you so much. Yes, sir. Thank you. I figured out that, sir, if for uh, while the participants are warming up, I can share a couple of uh, observations and experiences. Uh, indeed, uh, there we need two to tango, and there is there should be a, a wheel both uh, on the organizations uh, as well as uh, on the uh, resident coordinator and offices. And this should start from knowing each other better. And uh, uh, because uh, unfortunately, uh, not all the uh, colleagues in the UN system are familiar with the tripartite structure of the ILO and the way the ILO works and uh, why we keep uh, bringing uh, our constituents uh, uh, to, to the table. Uh, so, and I think that in this, uh, let's say promotion of what workers and employers organizations are doing, there is a big role of workers and employers organizations themselves. And uh, it is not, and I think it is very, uh, the interesting example uh, was mapping of contributions because daily work of both workers and employers organization is already contributing to the achievement of the SDGs. Uh, it's just, uh, yeah, it, the, the, there is a, a level of effort to, let's say, formulate it in more uh, UN-friendly uh, language. And I would say that uh, I'm sure that uh, myself and my colleagues are in the uh, Port of Spain office would be happy to support you in it and then have it presented uh, to, to the UN. So it's just that it's, it's not that or it's a very uh, thick additional level of work that you need to do or to contribute or to participate. Or it's just uh, uh, some, uh, some level of effort, but of course it, it is necessary. Uh, and I think that's uh, the second point, there was something, yes. And, and of course we also very well understand uh, the, the obstacles, uh, the, uh, the, the, the lack of human resources, uh, uh, both, uh, I, I, well, well, I of course I can speak more about trade unions, or, uh, and and indeed uh, this is an obstacle that we also should collectively uh, think of uh, how we can uh, support you. Uh, but again, we are here and uh, we are open to answer your questions too. Uh, I think this is it for now. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Vera. I think uh, those are important points and. You are so right. Um, uh, and when we look at the, the, the experience from Guatemala, it's not that without the SDGs, they would have had no projects. Uh, a daily work of, of trade unions and employers organizations is already a big contribution, but it's not mapped at present, right? So excellent point. And I see some more hands, but let me also just read what uh, is in the chat in the chat. There's a lot there. The role of workers' organizations is to inform workers about the SDGs. Absolutely. Uh, we need to know when the assessments take place so that we can be part of it. And um, yes, through social dialogue, we need to have more discussion on what the national targets are so that we can make meaningful contributions towards these goals. These are excellent points. Um, and let me give the floor to Clifton. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good day to everyone. Um, in Trinidad and Tobago, it is not that there hasn't been any attempt to, to address the SDGs and whatnot. The, the challenge that we are having here is that the government created an, its own policy agenda on what it wanted to create. And they, on two occasions, the state, I want to say the government, the state has called together multi party committees and to somewhat address these issues. And I suppose this is falling in line with saying, well, you know, you have a multi party committee. 
the challenge is, is that this the, the, the state and depending on which government it is involved they will bring specific things to the multi-party committee cost the rubber stamp and when we, even though we don't necessarily agree with those things the committee that is i should say not just the trade union movement the committee in general the government proceeds to, to continue on its own policy agenda that goes contrary to what the committee may recommend in most instances we have had campaigns from our trade union colleagues and behind the scenes from the employer representatives that the that they have complaints and they are not see they don't seem to be taken as serious as it's supposed to be and when there are government representatives on the committee they hardly ever turn up to meetings and whatnot so this creates creates an even greater challenge our problem is is that when it is being reported to the international community that they have a multi-party committee the 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 intricacies that take place behind the scenes are not being revealed and in some instances we have persons who are very conservative in this country who will not um expose those types of behavior and for fear that they will embarrass the government or it may be a government that they themselves are, are are familiar with and they don't want to form any embarrassment for them but the reality is it happens and it's not for want of trying for the trade union movement either we have been calling for it we want it okay thank you madam chair thank you so much uh, clifton those are very uh, serious concerns um i'm sure they are not unique to trinidad and tobago um we hear, of course, uh, similar concerns in other parts of the world. Um, and it's not also always easy huh, as, a, as a trade union to, um, to, to, to deal with that and to make your voice heard. No? I would then also wondering how, how, wonder how the UN office um, uh, plays its role and if it is supportive of, of a trade union calls, but um, maybe not necessarily at this moment because there are other uh, contributions there. Uh, Angelica Munoz. Hi, Linda. Hi, everyone. I'm sorry, I have a background noise, so I need to apologize. No for problem, that. we hear you well. <laughs> Yes, uh, there are some works. So now I wanted just to, to say that I, I agree with most of the colleagues and I think someone wrote on the chat that it is also good for monitoring of the implementation of the SDGs. And my personal opinion is that SDGs are anyway a responsibility of all and not, we should not be thinking that we are monitoring what the government is achieving, but we should contribute ourselves uh, to the achievement of the SDGs. However, what uh, from my experience happen oftentimes is that we create these tripartite commit, uh, committees and we uh, believe that we are sitting at the table with people that have the same capacity to, to develop uh, solutions for the SDGs. And that is not always the case. And not just on the capacity of the power that the uh, tripartite constituents can exercise in their own countries, but also of their capacity to work in certain thematic areas of the uh, of the SDGs. For example, um, I was previously working on uh, the achievement of SDG eight and four uh, through uh, vocational education and training in uh, the Central Asia uh, region, where uh, trade unions and employer organizations do not always have the the capacity to understand how they can actually provide solutions. And what we found that was very useful is that when we have tripartite commit committees, we have before uh, a small uh, training course in which we uh, once again have some peer learning session between countries of the same region to share the experience of how they can have actually contributed to the, the thematic area in their region. And then that way, some training unions and employer organizations can understand what their role is in the achievement of the SDGs. So I just wanted to, to highlight, I think, what the colleagues already said, uh, peer learning is important and also having some specialized kind of training and capacity development activities for each of the stakeholders. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Angelica Munoz. Uh, Vera, I see your hand. I don't know if it's an old or a new hand. Yeah, it is a new hand. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
to uh, maybe make a brief comment uh, to what the comrade from Trinidad and Tobago was saying, uh, because indeed uh, this uh, this happens. This happens not only in Trinidad and Tobago, where the government might might use uh, these committees to just uh, uh, say, okay, everybody was consulted uh, when uh, it was not uh, a real consultation. And this is why it is extremely important to try and establish our uh, uh, a relationship with the uh, resident coordinator and the office of the resident coordinator. And this is actually what we are uh, piloting now in Trinidad and Tobago. I'm not sure if you were uh, a participant uh, of the meeting that were organized by the ILO office uh, with the support of the Cipriani College of Labor and Cooperative Studies. We had two uh, workshops where, uh, uh, where uh, it was discussed how or to or and what to present to the, to the resident coordinator because of course if you just come and say okay talk to us or uh, it is it is not serious and there should be something that is brought on the table and so I just wanted to say that this is one of the pilots that we've started this year and we are going to continue our next year uh, with support of our uh, Bureau for Workers Activities uh, in headquarters uh, uh, so and we hopefully will be uh, able also to share uh, good results with other unions are in the region. Uh, so yeah, this is what I want to say. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, um, Vera, I'm putting it here in very general terms, but we, 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 uh, we understand that's a big effort huh? uh, of the ILO to, to, to support that. Um, I see some other comments in the chat. And uh, Julian, I think yours is also important that um, uh, unions having great collaboration with other civil society actors to monitor the implementation of the SDGs. That goes a little bit in the direction of, of, of the PAMPA experience. Huh? Uh, and of course, trade unions have a lot to say by themselves, but um, there may be indeed um, overlapping agendas with other civil society organizations and together you are stronger. Huh? I think that's a, that's a very good one. Um, what did I miss? Philip. Engaging you and local Hi. office to work on. Yes. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. I hear somebody. Oh, that was me. I need to. <laughs> I Go ahead. Peer learning, I think it would be good to mention uh, also clearly South South and Triangle Cooperation. Uh, mm -hmm. It's on the second bullet, so you don't have to add the lower. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would just add that more explicitly because as there is uh, some seed funds for South South, you know, also for next biennium, maybe it would be by having it explicitly as some kind of call that we can transmit to our managers, we can always say, well, this was a call from the the region, you know, to have this uh, element integrated over. Yeah. Just to say that in a few minutes, <coughs> I, I suppose in a few minutes, the seminar is ending as well. <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> we have actually one more minute, but that's a good point. Uh, Philip Walcott, I, I, a long comment, engage UN local office to work out the possibilities of cooperation. Identify projects of building capacity of trade union movement to more actively participate in the dialogue, form alliances with other social partners to address issues and be given a real voice. Excellent. Yeah, I will put that on as well. Um, we can have, I think, one last input before we close. No, but that's, um, I'm just making the last. Um, thank you so much for these inputs. We will make sure that um, everybody has them, that they're on the electronic campus. I think that was a, a quick, but very effective uh, brainstorming. Um, and it shows, you know, interest, it also shows um, um, bottlenecks, um, challenges that are that are serious and where, uh, as Vera was rightly saying, you know, the ILO office sometimes also needs to, to play its role in supporting the workers and employees organizations. Um, a nice list. I would like to close for today. Um, 
Our next webinar on Friday is on South-South and Triangular Cooperation. Um, so that is going to be very interesting. Also this week on the electronic campus, you will find three modules, uh, one on South-South uh, Cooperation, one on uh, the Common Country Assessment, and one then on what is the, um, the joint uh, country framework and how it is put together and implemented. These discussion points that we have here, we should also um, take them with us, think about them a bit more and take them to the last webinar next week, Monday, um, where we also have a speaker representing the resident coordinators offices in, in Trinidad and Tobago. So that is an opportunity for uh, further discussions in line with what uh, Philip was just saying, you know, engage with local UN offices to, uh, to gauge, to, to improve the possibilities of cooperation. So uh, thank you all very much for these, uh, for these inputs. Um, good luck with the self-guided modules. If you feel there is a lot there, don't worry. They will be on there for another month after the closure of the course. But try to uh, try to have a look uh, at the parts that are most interesting for you already. And uh, looking forward to see you on Friday uh, for the webinar that will be led by Anita Amorim. Have a great day and um, see you soon. Bye bye, everyone. Bye, Linda. Bye, Tana. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye, Bye. Bye everybody.